Hi, I'm Jason Casson, uh, CEO and co-founder of FilmTrack. Uh, FilmTrack is a contract rights and content management system, a uh, cloud-based system that supports uh, about 200 clients in the in the uh, global rights management community. We are the largest rights management provider on the planet. Uh, we are an insight portfolio company, and we're very pleased to be with you here today. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about metadata in the cloud, but I thought, given my uh, background as a teacher, um, I'm sure you're all happy and pleased to hear that, uh, I would start with a little bit of a history lesson, some of which you guys know. But the history is about the history of our fair industry. Uh, some of you know this, but where did the... Uh, uh, where did the, the industry begin? Where did the motion picture industry begin? Which state? Anybody? New Jersey. That is absolutely... What did you say? Eh, that's close. Um, why New Jersey? Because Edison, as you probably all know, uh, had much of the patents on the uh, equipment, the means of production, uh, the, uh, the, the lights, pretty much everything you needed to make the films. And in concert with a little company called Eastman Kodak and later uh, with Biograph and a few others, he created what was MPPC, I believe at the time, which uh, was a very litigious group that if you tried to film without their equipment or without their stuff, um, they would send thugs out after you. And uh, I know a little bit about this on a personal level because my grandfather, Morris Casson, actually ran Nickelodeon's uh, a little after the turn of the century uh, in New Jersey. He was not, to my knowledge, although I can ask someone, beaten by thugs. Uh, but uh, I know that the industry did not last long enough for him to, uh, to make his billions. However, what some folks that you know called Lemley and Zucker and Thalberg uh, and others uh, like them. Uh, this guy actually is kind of late to the table. Selznick. Not sure why we put his picture up. We should have gone. We should have gone with the five foot two Carl Lemley, who is a more interesting character. But uh, maybe it's harder to get his photographs. The point is, they came to Los Angeles uh, one to get away from Edison's thugs and the patent issues. Uh, Carl Lemley, I think, had been sued about two hundred and fifty times by Edison. Uh, but when they got here, they realized, man, it doesn't rain. It's light all the time, and within. Uh, Half an hour, an hour from L.A., I can be in mountains or beach or snow, et cetera, can film anything. Hence is our film industry. That's a little history class for you. Much of you, I think, in this audience already know that. But what's interesting about that is those independently minded folks who went on to uh, start those independent studios became little independent companies at the time called Universal, Paramount, and MGM. Uh, there's a lesson here for us as we sit here in the uh, exalted studios of YouTube, uh, Google, uh, the Netflix of the world, which is those of us who are not aware of the wave that's coming and don't get on our surfboard, uh, we're about to get wiped out by that wave so fast. And it is happening right now. We have a canary in a coal mine of what's happened with the music industry, but the means of distribution, the, uh, the mechid, the mechid, the mechanism by which we distribute and track content is changing so rapidly. The means of production are changing. Everything is changing. And we're living in an industry, by the way, another point of that history back 100 years ago is another tenant of the industry is don't tell the folks back east how much money we're making. So you have an industry that was built on opaqueness, not transparency. Right? It was an industry that was about hiding stuff. And it has been forever. And just because you know the Harvard MBAs came in in the 80s, and the Japanese money came in, in the late 80s, and the German tax funds came in the mid 90s, nothing changed. Right, So uh, that all is about to change, though, because the means of production, the means of distribution, the means of monetization are getting equalized. And so the ability to, I'm going to use the word, naturalize uh, uh, the opaqueness of data into a true transparency is right at our, uh, uh, right at our feet or our heads. Uh, so where, where are we now? We're now in the new normal of fragmented content. Uh, new distribution models, uh, distribution models getting upended, new consumption patterns, uh, new monetization models, and the very notion of how we create content is in flux. And risk mitigation is therefore changed, and obviously this creates a larger need for transparency for all the players across the IP chain. Why is it changing? Well, there's a few reasons. If you think about it, again, let's go into our Wayback Machine. The notion of television, the half-hour show, the hour show, that a half-hour is comedy and an hour is drama, that was not invented by Aristotelian concepts of drama and comedy. That was invented by Colgate and Palmolive, the companies that sponsored uh, 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 the, uh, the, the uh, Jerry Lewis uh, and uh, uh, Comedy Hour. And they dictated these uh, 
arcs, if you will, that we still live with today. The 13 episode arc, the half hour comedy, the hour drama, except if you notice what's been happening over the last few years, that's going away too, right? Because there's nothing natural to a half hour comedy. There's nothing natural to a one hour comedy. It's an artificiality that we've created uh, through, um, uh, through convenience. Just as, you know, everybody wants to know, why is a movie about an hour and a half, 90 minutes to two hours? Is there some magic thing? Have they done some psychological assessment of humans and all that? No, it's because it's three reels in the olden days. It's, it's, it's a three reel picture. So shorter, longer, different arcs, different timings, Netflix creating uh, and Google creating whole arcs at once and distributing it at once, monetizing it at once, the very notion of creation, how a writer thinks, how they work, they don't have to do outs, and they don't have to think in these terms. It's going to create totally new models. It has, right? It has, and we're watching it happen. So we need to be aware of that as we move everything into the cloud, uh, and I'll talk about what that means in a second, and how that, um, how that affects the back office systems, which is what I care and love about. Uh, I care and love about my children, my wife, my dog, to a lesser extent, uh, but also uh, about the back office tracking of this stuff. Because my thesis is that the mechanisms of distribution of content have evolved and multiplied, but the systems for actually tracking it have not caught up to what's actually happening in the real world. And that's where I find a need, and that's where I'm trying to fill that need. Uh, and it's a difficult thing because you want to make sure that you're accommodating not just for... Uh, VOD and the, and, and EST and the, and the de rigueur au courant of the day. But, you know, next year it's going to be, or two years, it's going to be holographic distribution and, and whatever else immersive technologies that we can invent. And you want to make sure the systems you have to track the royalties to track it or uh, the distribution models and how you're tracking by territory and by right, what those things mean. And again, not to draw too hard an analogy, but just like the mayors and, and, and Thalbergs and Zuckers and Lemleys left the oppression of the uh, East Coast, cold, dark, oppressive uh, uh, Edison. Uh, I don't want to slam Edison. He had good qualities. Um, don't know. No, he had good qualities. Um, but just as they did and created a new uh, equalized platform for themselves, which eventually, of course, just like all things, evolved into the, the, the new bosses, the same as the old bosses, the Who would sing, um, Likewise, we find now our ability for our filmmakers, distributors, financiers, everything moving to this equalized platform, whether it's financing through Kickstarter, whether it's distribution through VOD platforms, whether it's specialized narrow casting. I mean, if you read today, uh, David Zaslov, is that his name, of Discovery, you know, talking about how OTT is the future and those of us who are uh, uh, reluctant to embrace it or, or fail to see it coming are doomed. I mean, he, I think he literally said we're doomed. Uh, and this is the CEO of, of Discovery. So again, all of these things, it's critical that we have more and more stuff uh, available to everybody, not in some back office, what used to be a back office room of files, which later became a back office room of servers uh, and systems. It now needs to be available with the appropriate security and credentials everywhere and anywhere. And it needs to be the same and synchronous everywhere so that we have uh, the same data being served up regardless of where you're seeing a particular piece of content. And when I say the same data, I mean the metadata about what the f film or TV show or episode is, and also its characteristics, and also its contractual metadata, meaning who, when is it available to be seen, who is allowed to watch it, in what language, for what territory, for what right, who needs to, who needs to get paid, etc. And right now, there's a cottage industry of people making money off of the mistakes of us not having the right metadata and the right contract data around this content. And there are whole industries that all they do is get the missing data. And that's fine. And, and, and that's a, if that's your business, that's great. But wouldn't it be better if we managed it all? We being the people who manage and create, distribute, finance the content, uh, and, and uh, uh, modify the content, et cetera. So uh, I feel that the future, and many of us are already there, requires a different approach. It's not a siloed approach. Rather, it's a series of concentric circles, only because that looks nice in a PowerPoint, but also because it is philosophically the same of how we actually deal with the content, which is you have the content. Around the content, there are contracts that define the, contra uh, the content, meaning what rights you own, to whom you, to whom you have obligations, whether you are the rights in, rights out, who is the licensor, who is licensee, producer deal, writer deal, 
actor deal, whether this actor says it can't be shown in Germany without his consent because he's a big star in Germany, he has special rights and restrictions over German distribution. All of those things need to be codified and known, and known in a complete space. Uh, it can't be, whoops, we messed up, and then go back uh, and, and try to fix, because she don't work well that way. And around those contracts are the financials and royalties, which are all of the financial life and activity around the distribution, all of the money that comes in and out, all of the reporting, uh, all of the uh, uh, monies due out, due in, et cetera, and of course the distribution of the asset, which many of you folks here are directly involved in. And that is where a lot of the exciting work is, and I don't want to take any of the sexiness away from that. That is super exciting, and distribution is critical, and it's what gives birth to all of this. But in order for that to work well, for us to be able to deliver film and television of quality, you know, completely in a virtual uh, manner, we must have the systems that manage it and manage it super fast because it's not about guys on trucks getting reels places somewhere, which gave us a little bit of leeway. Uh, it's much different, much faster. We have to have systems. And those systems, again, I maintain, need to be typically SaaS-based systems, software as a service solution. Because if you look at this little analogy that somebody made about pizza, uh, this is a comparison of pizza to software. And uh, there's a traditional on-prem where you make your own pizza. And as you can see, the blue is what you're responsible for. And you're responsible for a lot making your own pizza. Now look, if you're an Italian guy who just came over from Sicily and you got the best menu, God bless, you should make pizza and I'll come over to your house and eat it. But not all of us are fortunate to be from Sicily or wherever the best pizza is, uh, Lombardi's, um, and, and, uh, and be able to partake in that. So sometimes we go to Trader Joe's and we just get the dough and we do a little bit outsourced, right? And that's an infrastructure of service and we're a little bit reliant on others. And then of course we go a little bit further and we have a platform on service where we're ordering it in. But still we've got to supply the dining room table and the soda and we got to clean up and everything. But software as a service takes it all away from us and we're no longer in the pizza business, which is good because in the beginning we weren't in the pizza business either. Again, we're not in the pizza business. We're in the movie business or TV business. So uh, I think it's important to make that distinction when we look at solutioning things, what we insource, what we outsource, uh, et cetera, to look, are we in this business and do we want to be in this business for a long time? Because the world is littered and filled with software solutions that were temporary. Like, we're just going to put this in place right now, said someone in 1987, and I'm still staring at that system now. And, and I know this because I've been writing software professionally since 1980. 1980. And Sadly, some of the solutions that I wrote back in New York in the 80s in platforms that I don't even want to discuss right now because not only will they age me, but it's embarrassing that I wrote in these platforms, are still in use to this date, and they should not be. This is an admission by the author. They should not still be in use uh, anymore, but they still are. Uh, and it is important for us to recognize to keep our systems in play. Look, we all love a classic car, but uh, my brother has a 66 Chevelle classic car. He doesn't drive it every day to work. You know, that's a special car. Uh, you know, you could drive it every day to work, but it doesn't have neck rest, it doesn't have AC, it doesn't have all the radio stuff. It's beautiful. It'll win awards and stuff. But it's much nicer to drive a new Hyundai even than that. Not, nothing wrong with a Hyundai, but still better. Uh, again, the other thing to keep in mind is that these systems, when you look at the entire IP lifecycle, need to be integrated. So... Uh, one approach, and I think it's an important approach, is to track the IP. And you, you notice I use the word IP as opposed to film or TV because it can be anything, webisode, music, brand, etc. But let's film and TV. It's important to have that accuracy from the beginning, from the nascent creation of the project. So whether it's a script coming in to whether it's Brad Pitt telling a producer, I'd like to get behind this film, that tracking, if you will, that submission, that notion of it needs to live in the system. If you're a producer or a studio, you want to have that history because it has evolved from a story about a boy and his dog to a story about a man lands on the moon, and we all know that that's how stories do evolve. Um, we want to know how it originated, and we, we need to track that chain and track that development cycle. And all of that information needs to be updated, and it needs to be available to everyone so that your website that's marketing uh, this title has that same information as the guy you're sending off to can to go sell it as to the production company that or, or, or post house that's doing the post work on it needs to share the same information you'd be surprised how often they don't or how often a cast member who was rumored or was attached or whatever who has nothing to do with the movie somehow manages to get into the credit block in can because they forgot to remove him and of course it always says credit not contractual at that point but it's still kind of embarrassing when the actor sees a big poster with his name on it for a film that you're selling and it's like i'm not in that movie um so uh important to keep because 
some of the other things that can happen is this. Uh, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but there was a situation where a uh, trailer for Nymphomaniac went out when it should have been uh, related to Frozen. They are very different films, similar thematically, uh, but, but different from a content standpoint. Uh, I think they were both about loss and love and, 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 and transformation, yes. Um, but, uh, but, but, but one was very animated and, 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 and musical and the other was frozen. No, uh, the, 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 point, the point is, is that we need, to, um, we need to do a better job of managing the metadata if we're in a, this universal utopian world, I don't mean universal in terms of the studio, although all praise be to them. Uh, I mean, if there were ability via API to access a given content owner's metadata, as there is, by the way, in the music side, uh, where we can go and check you know, who owns uh, what, what the publishing splits are for a particular song, if I need to pay out that song, I can find that out with pretty good ease, right? Uh, and people want me to know that information. On film, good luck finding out uh, the exact metadata. I, by the way, I want this synopsis in Swedish. What is the approved Swedish synopsis? Uh, and can I assure that the runtime is the actual runtime? All that sort of stuff, that needs to be concentrated. Good metadata, and again, we always talk about metadata is around the, the metadata around the title, the creative information, but it's also the technical details, you know, the audio details, uh, the, the audio channels, the audio tracks. These are not just esoteric things, they're also meaningful from a sales standpoint. When we go to sell or resell or relicense a film in a foreign territory, or even a domestic territory, and we're selling it to a Russian language station in the New York City area, let's say, well, we need to know, A, do we have the Russian language track? Because if we don't, how much is it going to cost us to, 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 to dub or sub that track? Maybe it's not worth it to do this deal. Oh, God bless, we actually have a Russian language track. It's sitting in the lab in Jersey, and we're going to ship it over, and it's great, and this is a good deal for us. But knowing not just the answer to what is available for France for horror films, it's what is available for France for horror films to which I have French language tracks, uh, and are those tracks available and in good shape, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a multidimensional question, and critical that we have good metadata for everything from programming, VOD, et cetera. I mean, I've looked on, uh, uh, you know, I have been known to pipe in a movie or two via VOD, and it's amazing sometimes who they say is starring in the film and it's someone who has a. And so I, I remember recently I was I was very taken by the film Taken, uh, and and the you know the three ones where Liam Neeson has a very special set of skills where he kills people who kidnap his wife or daughter or both. But when watching the you know on on uh, on the menu it said I couldn't find it because it was starring who was the young lady who was in X Men, uh, Famke Janssen. It said Taken starring Famke Janssen, and I'm like well, that seems like an interesting movie, but. She is in the movie, by the way, and she plays the wife, and she doesn't have an insignificant role, but Liam Neeson's kind of a, he is the guy. He's taken. I mean, he's Mr. Taken. Um, so, again, it's really critical that we have the same metadata everywhere, because otherwise, uh, someone's incorrectly renting a Famke Johnson film, which, again, she may be wonderful and great, but that's not the, I was fortunate to know that she played the wife. Um, so, what are the benefits to having all your data in the cloud? Because I know in the wake of you know, things that uh, uh, recent studios on security, there's been a little bit of concern about what do I put in the cloud, what don't I put in the cloud, how secure is it, et cetera. I would argue that it actually is more secure than your local server for several reasons. One of which is your local server can get this happening, which is a keyboard. And I think the most insecure method of access is typically someone inside with a keyboard not some random hacker somewhere. Uh, uh, they, are assist they are working, but the person with the keyboard access or access to those servers or can put a thumb drive in somewhere, I can't get to my servers. They're, they're behind a locked door somewhere. My engineers can't get to them. I'm, uh, I'm counting on the good people of Amazon to take good care of them. But uh, the security is something that, again, I am uh, allowing other companies to invest in on my behalf. So access to the cloud is instant access, and you need that instant access to be secure. Uh, what I'll, I'll create a word called APIable, uh, which is not a real word, but which means that you're able to access that data, query it, and I would argue both push and pull uh, with the appropriate security and SOX compliance around it, but you want to make sure that the people who have access to the data also are some people who have access to change the data, uh, and you should be able to do that uh, regardless of what system you're using if you have the appropriate APIs. And then 
there's a holy grail that I'd like to get us all behind, which I know the good folks at, at Adobe are very interested in, which is access, not transfer. We're all obsessed with the size of our pipes, no pun intended, um, and, and how fast we can move files around. And that's important, and it will remain important. I got asked something about that today. However, if you can imagine a place, and, and Adobe is getting there with Adobe Anywhere and some other folks, where we're not, frankly, the Apple methodology on, on, on its consumer products is very much uh, in this manner, where we're not moving giant files all the time. We're just pointing to them. And we're allowing whatever device, whatever uh, function that we're doing, we talked about this at our uh, uh, production in the cloud conference earlier, that we're getting better and better at making the cloud the giant hard drive in the sky and to have the same experience you would have as if it were local. And again, I could argue that that experience up there is more secure than having a nice file down here that I'm editing that when I go out to have a, a smoke, even though I don't smoke, but let's say I go out for coffee, even though I don't drink coffee, but I go out for something, and uh, and then somebody just comes and thumb drives me, and voila, Wolverine's out on the net. Uh, and so uh, I, would, I would argue that, again, the more we can get to access, not transfer, betwixt the players, because, again, from my experience at our company, FilmTrack, we work with financiers, distributors, collection account managers, uh, exhibitors, etc. They're all touching the same assets, the same contracts, etc. And because of culture, not because of technology, but because of culture, they're moving the same file up and down, up and down, up and down. They're moving the same contracts up and down, up and down, up and down. I'd love to see them passed around. Uh, because again, I know that's a utopian vision, but it will ensure that the uh, data is synchronized, is the same, and that everybody's working off the same tenants. And again, hard to do culturally because let's go back to our history lesson, the industry wasn't built on transparency. So it's a bit of an uphill uh, battle. Uh, and then, of course, the analytics that come with the cloud storage, where you have all this data in one place, and you can do some really interesting analytics around delivery, sales, production, distribution, uh, all that fun stuff, and, of course, collaboration, which is uh, why we're all here today. So um, those are my prepared remarks. And as you can see, they were very carefully prepared. Um, I, I'd, uh, I, I will say thank you. But before I do, I wanted to just get questions, if anybody has any specific questions. Uh, and uh, I'd be happy to answer them if they're within my knowledge base. Uh, Brennan, here you go. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, Jason, um, I totally agree with your opening premise that, that Hollywood has a bunch of hidden um, power structures when it comes to, to pricing and availability. Uh, the cloud is obviously from technology increasing transparency, but what, what's, what, what in your opinion is going to motivate content owners, studios, networks, in order to become more transparent? I mean, what's, what's, what, what's their incentive to do a level playing career? I don't know if they have one yet. I think their incentive will be the competition doing it. That's what I mean by the independent world. So I think the more folks create their own content or mid-range, I'm, I'm not talking about user-generated content, but million-dollar movies, webisodes, and get them on Amazon and, and YouTube and, and Hulu, et cetera, uh, and that that content is not being generated, let's call it corporate, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but non-corporate content, I think it's going to force, I think competition forces it. I think market forces it. I don't think there's any kind of like, we'll show you it's more secure with this 99.99% thing. I don't think there's any, um, you know, uh, Gartner study that will do it or anything like that. I think it's just the market force. I may be wrong, but that's my... Would you agree? I mean, what's your thinking? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I would also say that they're starting to realize because because they want to get good content to more outlets. They're starting to realize how much pain happens downstream and, and where they think it's leaving the facilities with metadata. They're starting to realize how jacked up it gets later in the value stream. That's right. And I think they are starting to understand that that it's they can get more content out there at the right margin if they allow this problem to be fixed rather than fight it. That's right. And again, to that Edison thing, uh, don't fight it because you might lose it. You know, uh, and I was going to ask you also to, in your mind, you... when you extrapolate the cost savings, you know, how do you, you know, ultimately we're taking something that's been a very, very manual process forever, right? And trying to streamline it, especially yep. around avails, right? With what Google's doing with Sony, et cetera, yep. et cetera, et cetera. In your mind, do you see this being something that is open in an exchange and is not touched 
by humans because it's been done so far upstream that there's no longer I think it'll policing? always have a human touch because I think there are contractual elements that are negotiated in hotel rooms in Cannes and Berlin that are not easily codified by computers that need to be represented and understood on a human level, um, certainly on bigger content. But we can automate this, but just like any uh, transitional or disruptive technology, there are entrenched interests who don't want to see it automated. There are entrenched interests, just as there were as we moved to digital distribution. Sure. Uh, I don't want to get beat up now, but you know, I remember the guys when in the, in the mid-90s or early 90s used to come and pick up the reels of film at the company that I was working at every day to go and put them on the... And those were not guys... And I'm from Brooklyn. I don't want to mess with those guys. And those were my distributors. Uh, those guys took the cans every day and got them to the movie theater. And uh, those guys don't do that anymore. And they did not go uh, quietly into the night. And I guess this... The, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Freddie takes care of your movie, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, the other thing is, is when we look at information like that now, we are in the past. Because you think about some of this avail information that is now it's all top secret, it's windowed, but, but ultimately the consumer is going to demand this data um, and it's going to say, I, you know, I don't want to be left in the dark anymore. Yep. And we kind of have to, you know, so from an evangelism perspective. It's, it's hard even, so down to the consumer is even an, an extra leap we haven't gotten to yet. Right now I'm seeing a lot of my clients who are content owners selling to their content buyers, right? So let's say from a sales agency distributor. A year ago, they held their avails like this. You wanted their avails, you flew out 10,000 miles to Cannes to meet them three times a year, and maybe they showed it to you if they liked the cut of your jib. Yeah. And first they want to know, did you like that? Yeah. Well, it's not available for your territory, but let me show you something else that does. It's a, it's a sales-oriented thing. So telling them what you own and telling them your inventory, which, by the way, is how so many other industries work right now online, uh, where you have a naked view of their inventory, open kimono view, is antithetical to how this industry has worked. However... We have seen a big sea change in the last year. So, uh, full disclosure, I'm involved with another company called Rights Trade, and Rights Trade is an online B2B marketplace for rights. Uh, people who use FilmTrack and other solutions can connect to it, show their avails to buyers. Right? A year ago, or even a little, you know, two years ago, it would have been uh, uh, anathema, unthinkable to people to show their avails dynamically live online. So what we've done is we've said, listen, you know, we've got them in slowly into the bathtub. We said, the people who are seeing it are your buyers. The people who are seeing it, you have validated. The people seeing the same people you're going to see in Cannes uh, uh, are the same people you're seeing in Berlin. So it's not showing it to the public yet. It's showing it to your other buyers, which, by the way, if you think about it, instead of now seeing the avails three times a year, they're seeing it 365 days a year, constantly updated and dynamic, and it's creating a more lucrative business model for everyone. The buyer, instead of having to send 15 people to can to go and canvas the place for new material for their uh, Australian airline uh, deal, they can send four people or five people. So there's cost savings, and they can buy all year long on the platform. So that platform and others like it, uh, but hopefully that one, um, are are methodologies that we think are being embraced slowly by the industry. Again, independence first, and there are dozens and dozens of companies on there. What's interesting is dozens of companies on there, and now the majors are on there, but as buyers. So it's just like, I'm not going to show you what I have, but I'd like to see what you have. Uh, and so soon that will transition because everybody's a buyer and a seller in our industry. Uh, but I do think that there is a trend to uh, transparency as relates to avails. Again, on certain product and projects. You know, the big Star Wars 7, something like this, or Avatar 3, it's handled differently. But for your, you know, uh, the, the multitude of product that's out there and certainly the library content and things like that, uh, um, you know, just a quick side story. I think one of the reasons I got into this industry, my father and my family ran a summer camp after the Nickelodeons failed, summer camp in the Catskills. And um, every year they would show films and the films, my father would pick from this book that came once a year and it was like a catalog of films you could show. And it had like 80,000 years, you know, 80,000 Leagues Under the Sea and, the, and uh, you know, all those uh, Harry Housen, you know, uh, uh, Sinbad stuff. And I would look through them and was so excited what you could get for the camp. And I'd help pick. You know, every Friday night they showed a movie. Uh, you know, uh, what's the girl with the uh, Pippi Longstockings? You know, and that book doesn't exist anymore. Or at least if it does, I don't know about it. So... That's what Rights Trade purports to be, or other systems like it, where you can put your professional content up there and let you know some camp uh, somewhere or uh, or wherever get your content. Anyone else?
Anybody want to wrestle? No? Just so you know, the pizza as a service is actually done by Albert Barron of okay. IBM, and he'll actually be speaking at NAB at the Cloud Oh, Track. great. I want, thank you for... Uh, I did not take credit for that. Oh, yeah. No, I know. I know. I just... Yes. Uh, yeah, so I thought that was really fascinating, too, because it's really the way Hollywood's always kind of worked. Mm -hmm. This is what I want to do. This is not what I want to do. So, yep. well, thank you so much, Jason. Thank you guys for having me.